The word of life deals with many scriptural principles regarding the nations of the world. But all of them have reference to how those nations interact with God's people, the children of Israel. And in Ezekiel chapter 38, that we had a, posh, uh, a, par- a few verses read from, gives us an awful lot of information concerning what God is going to cause to happen to the nation that we know today as Russia. And I'd like to try, if we can, to take you through some of the things that the Bible records concerning why that is to take place and what this uh, nation of Russia stands for in the Scriptures of Truth. Because it's, it's very important that we understand God does things for a reason, that his will, his plan, and his purpose is going to be brought to fulfillment very, very soon when he sends his son back to the earth. And this, this picture that we, we have of, and we've read partly of in Ezekiel 38 about this nation referred to as Gog being pulled down. We read there, didn't we, of, of, in verse 4, of, of having hooks put in their jaws and pulled down into the land of Israel is fulfilling a principle that has been taking place really since the very start of creation. We have had since the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of of, uh, Eden, we have had a battle taking place. A battle between the seed of the serpent that beguiled Eve and led Adam and his wife to transgress that law that God had put in place versus the seed of the woman, which we know is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a battle taking place between those who want to follow the way of the serpent versus those who want to be associated with the seed of the woman and the hope that comes with that centered in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a battle. And what we're reading of in Ezekiel 38 is a culmination of that battle against all of those nations led by Gog, Russia, against the Lord Jesus Christ. And the destruction of this worldly power that is antagonistic, and all the other nations with her, against God and his people. That's what Ezekiel 38 is very clearly teaching us as we go through these things. And so I want to try tonight, if we can, to look at some of the things and to try and prove to you from Scripture the detail we have concerning events which are very soon to be fulfilled. In fact, as we were driving here, Sarah sent me a text to say, there's just been sent a news that that, uh, Russia are are planning to invade, um, it was... Ukraine, thank you. They are gearing up, aren't they? I think we've all seen it. Russia flying their planes, sailing their ships, very close to waters and to nations in a very confrontational way. And we're going to have a little look at that. So if you haven't got your Bibles open, I'm going to put some of the the, the, the verses on the slides, but I encourage you to turn with me to uh, the uh, Ezekiel 38. And let's just go in at verse 1. Because we have the word of the Lord, the word of God, the creator and sustainer of all life, came unto me. This is Ezekiel saying. That's what it says in verse 1. God's words came to this prophet Ezekiel and he says, Son of man, set thy face against Gog. Now there are some people who believe that that son of man is referring to Ezekiel. Well, it isn't. Ezekiel was sometimes referred to as the Son of Man, but this is an event that is yet to take place. And the Son of Man that we are referring to here is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want me to prove that, just open up your Bibles. Keep a marker in Ezekiel 38. Come over to Matthew and chapter 8. And in Matthew chapter 8, we have very, very clearly laid before us the position of the Lord Jesus Christ, referred to by this very title the son of man Matthew chapter 8 and verse 20 where we read and Jesus said unto him 
The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. The Lord Jesus had no permanent abiding place and he refers to himself as the Son of Man and that's exactly to whom Ezekiel is referring in chapter 38. He's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says very specifically, set thy face against. Now you'll see here, I've put on the slide, three times in these early verses, we have that idea of setting thy face against. And that word against isn't just a word that talks about being in opposition to. That Hebrew word, when you look it up in the concordance, signifies not merely opposition, but to take action against. And that's very important because the Lord Jesus Christ, on his first uh, 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 coming to the earth, he was like a lamb, wasn't he? Led to the slaughter, put to death by cruel hands of, of his people and the Roman authorities of the day. And he did that willingly. He allowed that process to take place. He didn't fight against it. He accepted it. That was the bruising of the heel. Where the serpent power, that which is antagonistic and opposed to God, is going to be bruised in the head. A permanent, fatal destruction. And that's what we're reading of in Ezekiel 38. Set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And so we have this term, Gog, introduced to us. When you look that word up, it simply means a rooftop, a place of the roof, the top of, or one in command. And if I just put a map of the globe upon which you and I live, brothers and sisters, there's only one nation that truly depicts in geographical uh, uh, manner a nation that is on top of, it's the nation we know today as Russia. And this idea of Gog is referring very clearly to this nation. And, and we're going to look at, at why and where the origins of this land have come from. Uh, Ezekiel was written uh, about 580 years before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he li lists out these nations, Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And so I want to try and show to you very clearly what nations these are, how we can demonstrate uh, wh where they've originated from uh, and where they come from. Now that word Gog is associated with the chief prince. Did you see that? Gog, which means the rooftop, the top of, the one in command, of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. And that phrase, chief prince, is rendered the prince of Ross, or Rus. And, and Ross itself signifies the head, or poison. Ross represents that serpent power that we have already tried to briefly introduce you to. That, that, that head that has to be bruised because it is representative of all of the nations that have been antagonistic and opposed to the truth of God. If you look up in uh, many of the non-Christadelphian publications, this is the Encyclopedia Britannica, Gisenius, Gibbon's Decline and Fall and uh, other references, they all confirm that Russia is derived through that word, Rus or Ross, the chief prince. That's the idea. Gog, the prince of Rosh, is what we're having described for us in Ezekiel chapter 38. That's why we're so convinced of this nation representing the land that we know today as Russia. 
And, and, and the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, is being told to set thy face against Gog. And you could read it that you think Gog of the land of Magog, but that's not exactly what the scripture is referring to. The, the land of Magog is separate to the land of Russia, and we'll demonstrate that for you uh, uh, in, in a few moments by going through uh, some of these, uh, these points. Here is a map that is a very old map, uh, a, a map um, as recorded by Herodotus, so uh, an awful long time ago, this doesn't really represent in, in the same type as, as we would understand of modern day maps, but it's talking about the place of Russia. And if I just zoom in a little bit for you here and you look at that, there's a place called Scythia. And that was very much in uh, the uh, central portion of northern Europe as we would understand today. And this map is defining for us the, the place for where the Scythians who spread from the river Tanis or, the, or Don westward along the banks of the Ister or as we would know it today, the, the Danube. This was the area later known as Hungary and Transylvania. And the land of Magog, therefore, which I'm going to show to you is representative of Scythia, refers not to Russia, but to the uh, area that was given over to these uh, uh, nations. This is a more modern day map, and you can see I've highlighted on there for you the land of Magog or Scythia. It's the Germanic central portion of Europe. It's, it's a land that, that clearly isn't speaking of Ross and Russia in the, in the north uh, um, east, but it's central Europe. And, and there's some wonderful things that were told about uh, the destruction of Russia and the destruction of Magog. In fact, if you turn over to Ezekiel chapter 39, obviously Ezekiel 38 is talking about the destruction of Russia as they are brought down into the land of Israel, and we'll show that to you in a second. But if you come to verse 6 of Ezekiel 39, what do we read about Magog? I, I will send a fire on Magog, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So Magog, and the punishment inflicted on Magog, is a secondary event to the destruction of the Gogian host and its confederacy that is recorded in Ezekiel 38. So Ezekiel's very clear. Magog is a different land. It's of that region of Scythia, and it is different and separate to what we're having by the way of Gog. Now there's a lovely little point here, if I just go back to uh, our, our points. We have lots of prophecies within the scriptures of truth that help us understand what's taking place. Again, keep a little marker in Ezekiel chapter 38, and if you've got your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter 2, if you wouldn't mind. Because Daniel chapter 2, and I've put the image of how and what this chapter refers to, but in Daniel chapter 2, we get given some more clarification about what is taking place in Ezekiel 38 and to whom it, it is taking place and by whom these things are happening. If you look at verse, 30, uh, well, f f verse uh, 31, Thou, O king, sawest and behold, this is Daniel giving the interpretation to what the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, had actually seen in his dream, in his night vision. And this is what he says, O king, thou sawest a great image. This great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, the breast and his arms of silver, the belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. And thou sawest, till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were iron and clay, and broke them to pieces. 
Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, now notice this, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away and no place was found for them and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And that stone that smites the image on the feet, as we can see in the, in, the, in, the, in the pictorial description of these events, crushes those whole sets of nations and the things that they stood for together. When that image is standing up, and all those nations, the Babylonian, the Persian, the Greece, the Roman, the two legs of, of iron and, 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 of, and the feet of iron and clay, it's, it's symbology of of, of the world as you and I see it today, those feet are ten toes, part of iron, representative of the Roman Catholic apostate system which has infiltrated in the main the world, mixed with clay, clay, the substance of the earth from when man was taken. It's a, it's a very graphical picture of the nations of the world divided, influenced by the Roman Catholic uh, 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 apostate teaching of, of the understanding of the Bible mixed across the, all of mankind and that stone is the Lord Jesus Christ cut out of the mountain without hands and strikes the image grinds it to powder blows it away like the threshing floor of all that wheat that is dispersed and fills that earth with a mountain that is a wonderful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, of what he is going to do in Ezekiel chapter 38 when he destroys the nations of the world. And so Gog is this term that is very much referring to a symbolic name of world leaders and powers that stand against the creator of heaven and earth and his people. And in Ezekiel chapter 38 that we had read, we have a list of nations. And if it's not clear already, let me try and explain to you to whom these nations refer. We have in verse 2, we have, along with Gog, we have that land of Magog, Central Europe. We have the chief prince, the prince of Rosh. We also have Meshech and Tubal. We would know that as Moscow and Tubalski. But along with the Gogian host, there are a confederacy of nations, and they're listed out for us in verse 5. If you've got your Bibles open, there it is, Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, with them, all of them with shield and helmet, in a military array. You don't come with a shield and a helmet to go and play in the park. This is a military array, a, a great company of, of bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Verse 6, Goma and all his bands, the house of Togomar of the north quarters and all his bands and many people with thee. And you might say, well, oh, Clive, what's so important about those nations? What, what, why these nations? What, where, where have they come from and, and what purpose are these in, in Ezekiel chapter 38, well, there's a little uh, earlier use in Scripture of all of these names. In fact, if you come to Genesis chapter 10, and I'll show you this as simply as I possibly can, but it's very, very important for us to understand that these nations, the ones listed out here, without exception, have all come from very, very close origins to the children of Israel. In fact, in Genesis chapter 10, we have the descendants of Noah listed out. There it is, chapter 10 of Genesis, verse 1. Now, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and unto them were sons born after them. The sons of Japheth, who have we got? Gomer, that's in Ezekiel 38. Magog, that's in Ezekiel 38. Madai, I'll show you that's in Ezekiel 38. Meshech, Tyrus, those are in Ezekiel 38. And Togomar in verse 3. Come down a little bit further, you've got Cush and you have Foot. Cush is the, modern, the old name for Sudan or Ethiopia. 
Ethiopia is listed in Genesis, in Ezekiel 38, and foot is the old word for Libya. And all of these nations that are listed out here are of the descendants of Noah, the only faithful man and his three sons that were saved from the destruction of the flood. When that world got so corrupt that God had no other option but to destroy those wicked people and the things that they were doing. As it is in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. The things we're seeing take place in the world before our very eyes, the wickedness, the depravity, the things that the world find acceptable was exactly the same in the days of Noah. And all of these nations, how significant that is, my dear friends, that these nations that came through the flood, that were saved in the ark, have gone to such an extent that God can no longer work with those people. They've gone so far away from his truth that what they were saved from is now being brought back upon them by way of destruction. Isn't that remarkable? And it teaches us, my dear friends, that God expects those who want to serve and worship him to do so in accordance with his will and purpose. We can't come to worship before God in a way that we think is acceptable. It has to be to God's way. And these nations that have now gone so far away from their original uh, 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 understanding are now once again in a position of destruction. And there are nine nations there listed out, and nine in the scriptures, all, all numbers in the scripture represent something spiritual. The number nine speaks about judgment, the finality of judgment. How fitting that is that there are nine nations listed in Ezekiel 38 that are going to receive the finality of judgment. And if I plotted them on a modern day map, you'll see we had that word there, um, Madai. Um, Madai, and I've plotted it on this, on this little map. Um, this is the area that we would know today as Persia. So that's a nice simple one to, to, to try and explain. But what about Tyrus? That isn't listed in Ezekiel 38, but it is listed in Genesis chapter 10. Well, when you follow the dispersion of these nations and the history of them, of where they moved, Tyrus, one of the sons, the descendants of Japheth, arrives in this area. Now, again, I, I put it on a little map. You can, you can see it here, Scythia to the, to the, to the east and, and Tyrus here. Th this nation, this people, firstly descended to that region. If we go through the maps, you can see that that is right there on the edge of the Black Sea. It's the area for where Tyrus first settled. And as we go through and we look at all the maps, we can see this area on the Black Sea. You can see it here up in the, in, in the, in the, in the north um, uh, west of, of the Black Sea at Tyrus. That's where he settled. That's where that nation descended. And when we move through more modern day maps, we see the development of where Tyre originated from. Tyre was the very first area that we can associate with the origins of the nation of Russia. And through the Mongol invasion that took place in the 13th uh, century, Tyre was pushed north. The people of Tyre, firstly to Kiev, then to Moscow, then to Vladimir, and then finally settling back in Moscow, the capital city of this area. And therefore, Tyrus is listed out very clearly in Genesis chapter 10, one of the descendants of the sons of Japheth, as befitting of this land of Rus and Rosh and Rush, the head, Gog, the Gogian host. It's beautiful how all of the scripture ties together. And we also have uh, Meshech and Tubal that we've probably already loosely touched on and, and their separate destruction uh, at the uh, at, at a future time from Ezekiel chapter 38, a, a later period. And if I put all these on a modern day map, got Mago, Germanic speaking countries, we've got Ross as Russia, Meshech, we've got as Moscow, Tubal, Tubalski, 
Persia, we, we've said, is uh, uh, Iran. Kush, we've got as um, uh, the Sudan and Ethiopia. Foot, we've got as Libya. Goma, as France. And Togomar, as Turkey. These are the nations that are affiliated or confederate with this Gogian host. So if you turn back with me to Ezekiel chapter 38, what we see in those first nine verses of Ezekiel 38 is the assembling of these nations together, brought about by the divine hand of Almighty God, positioning them, affiliating them to be in the right position for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. What does it say in verse 7 of Ezekiel 38? Be thou prepared. Prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. So Russia, Gog, is going to be a guard uh, 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 with these nations that are assembled together with him. A great company, we said, of bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords, prepared for war. Now, swords and shields might not be a... Uh, a a particular good depiction of, of military, but it sets the scene, doesn't it? In Ezekiel's day, those were their weapons of war. Do you know if you list out how powerful Russia are today? I just put some statistics, which I took from um, online. Are they 100% accurate? I don't know. But they give us a good indication of the, of the power of Russia today. Of 142 million uh, inhabitants of the nation, Nearly 3.6 million are in the military. That's a massive percentage. They have a total aircraft strength of over 4,000 with nearly 900 fighter aircraft and, and 22,000 combat tanks and total naval vessels of 352. If you compare that to the United Kingdom, who have a population of 65 million with just 233,000 versus 3.6 million, it's a little bit of a, a, a disparity there, isn't it? We've only got 800 aircraft. We've only got 331 combat tanks versus 22,000. We've only got 76 naval assets with two aircraft carriers. There is a position that Russia has been investing and preparing for military combat for many years. This hasn't just happened. I remember in my lifetime as a young lad that the nation of Russia was so poor it paid its military personnel with potatoes. And today, with the strength and the uprising that this nation has had, is showing to us that this scripture that was written so long ago is coming to fruition. Who'd have thought that Russia would be the dominant power in the world. We think of the USA. We think of that global role as a policeman globally that they have fulfilled for many years, backing out of all the troubled areas, coming out of Syria. Who went straight in? Putin. Backing out of the Middle East and doing it from afar, withdrawing their troops. Who fills that void? Putin and the, and, the, and the nation of Russia. They are preparing for military combat, just as Ezekiel has recorded for us and left on record. I, I put a little chart, chart together, and you can, you can research this for yourself. How many nations has Putin visited since 2017? And where has he gone? Who's he gone to see? Well, I highlighted them in yellow. I know it's difficult for you. But they are all those nations that we have been listing out in Russia, uh, in Ezekiel 38. We've got Belarus, we've got Italy, we've got France, we've got Mongolia, Turkey, France again, Turkestan, Hungary. Uh, we've got the, um, the, the, uh, the, the parts of, of Africa in 2021, and this is more modern. We've got Syria, Turkey, Germany. These are all the nations that... Putin has visited. These are all the nations that he has been influencing, surely in fulfillment of 
taking a God upon them, making relationship. They're not all of his friends, but he's made arrangements and, and seen there. In, 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 in October, um, uh, just a few years ago, Russia held the first African Congress. We've got Libya and Ethiopia, Sudan, those African nations that are listed out in Ezekiel 38. And if you plot them on a map, it's that whole territory of Central Europe up into the North Quarters and those countries in Africa that we can see. Putin has been fulfilling exactly as Ezekiel 38 describes relationships with these nations that are very clearly defined as assembling behind Gog in a military combat. But you have to say, where is it going to take place? Well, Ezekiel tells us exactly where it takes place. Ezekiel 38 and verse 8 says, After many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years, thou shalt come into the land. The land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel. The scriptures are so specific. You are going to come, you're going to be having hooks put into your jaws and brought, bring you down into the land that was once laid waste that is being brought back from the sword against the mountains of Israel. And they shall dwell safely, all of them. And, and in those verses, my dear friends, we have a picture. The nation of Israel that was dispersed in AD 70 and spread across the four quarters of the earth in 1948 became a nation. I haven't got time tonight to expound that in detail. It's another Bible lecture all on its own. But they were brought back into the land. The land that we once knew as the land of Palestine. A land that Mark Twain visited in 1867. And he records very clearly that it was a desolate land. A land silent and mournful. mournful. A desolation is here that not even imagination we never saw a human being on the whole route there was hardly a tree or a shrub anywhere even the olive and the cactus those fast friends of the worthless soil had almost deserted the country 1867 mark twain visited the land of israel and wrote that and yet today the nation of Israel, and their people are back in the land. They're dwelling in relative safety. Safety that they have brought upon, they think, themselves. They've got the Iron Curtain. They've erected the walls around. They've got a, a, a number of technologies which they're reliant upon, and they're proud of, and they are boastful of their position in world standing. In fact, they're overconfident. They're leading the way in technology. I deal with a number of Israeli companies that have got technology that far exceeds what we've got in the West. What does it say in Ezekiel chapter 39 and verse 26? This is a lovely little verse. And they have borne their shame and all their trespasses where they have trespassed against me when they dwelt safely in their land. And none made them afraid. When I have brought them again from the people, and I have gathered them out of their enemies' lands, and I am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations, then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. But I have gathered them into their own land, and have left none of them any more there, Neither will I hide my face any more from them, for I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. You see, my dear friends, the nation of Israel are back in the land of Israel. But they're up there in the acknowledgement that God has brought them back. They're there, brothers and sisters, and dear friends, 
In their self-confidence of their own technology, they've found oil and gas just off their shores. They've got medical advances. We know that they have uh, recently been leading the world in that COVID vaccination program, haven't they? They're back in the land. But as Ezekiel 39 records for us, dwelling safely, but they are going to be punished once again. They are going to be punished by this invasion of the Gogian host. And when Russia descends down upon that land, it is not as a friendly visit. In fact, it is Britain, the Sheba and Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish that say, Art thou come to take a spoil? Art thou come to take a prey? And the Christadelphians, with our understanding of Bible truths, have been echoing this very event for the last 150 or 60 so years, uh, Brother Thomas, John Thomas, one of the founders of the Christadelphian movement, wrote this in 1850 in, in his book, Help is Israel. The future movements of Russia are notable signs of the times because they are predicting in the scriptures of truth when Russia makes its grand move for the building up of its image empire then let the reader know that the end of all things as is present constituted is at hand. Ezekiel 38 and the events of what is soon to take a place are going to herald a massive transformation of the land of Israel and the rest of the world. I haven't got time to go into Daniel 11 tonight if you compare Daniel 11 verses 40 to 43 about those nation of Go coming down into the land, coming from the north, coming down through Turkey, going into Egypt, and then coming up from Egypt into the land of Israel, it's a very graphical picture. And that little verse I just quoted in Ezekiel 38 verse 13 of of Sheba and Dedan, of the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, unto Gog, art thou come to take a spoil? Art thou come to take a prey? To carry away silver and gold? To take away cattle and goods? To take a great spoil? And the answer to that question is in verse 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy, and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people of Israel dwell safely, shalt thou not know it? And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses and a great company and a mighty army, that's Russia and all of its army, and thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. So this event of Russia coming down from the north quarters into the land and attacking the nation of Israel is a sign to the Gentile nations, to the heathen, to the nations of the world, that God is in control. And that's why this is so exciting for us to expound to you tonight. Because when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, as he ascends to the Mount of Olives, that Mount of Olives is going to split in the middle. There is going to be an earthquake of massive proportion that reverberates around the whole earth, all the way across all the four corners of the earth. And look what verse 17 says. And these are, these are very worrying. These are very concerning words. Thus saith the Lord God, verse 17. Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years what I would bring against them? And it shall come to pass at that same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel. There's no doubt. Thus saith the Lord God that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. And surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. That's what we're reading of. 
When the Lord Jesus Christ stands on the Mount of Olives, it will cleave in the middle. There's going to be a great shaking of the land of Israel to the extent that the fishes of the sea, verse 20, the fowls of the heaven, the beasts of the field, and all creeping things that creep upon the earth, and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. And the mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. What a devastation is about to take place, my dear friends. And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. There's going to be infighting of the nations. There's going to be, verse 22, I will plead against him with pestilence. We think the COVID pandemic has been a terrible pestilence, and it has. But it's going to be nothing compared to what God will pour out in this day. I will rain upon it, him and upon his bands, and upon many people that are with him, an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus, he says in verse 23, will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. My dear friends, there is a warning in Ezekiel 38 of exactly what God has planned and laid in store for the removal of those nations which are opposed to him and his people. He's going to punish his people Israel for their previous errors and disobedience to his laws. In fact, two-thirds of the nation of Israel will die in this battle. Two-thirds. It's a battle of massive proportion and what are we going to do about it what are we going to do in order to prepare ourselves for the things that the scriptures have clearly laid on record for us well what we've seen tonight is God's plan on this earth is real what he has written and recorded and left on record for our learning and for our admonition is there to warn us, to prepare, to make ourselves ready. And God has extended to all of those that would be willing to listen an opportunity to know this plan and to be a part of that new kingdom that as that stone that was cut out without hands destroys the old nations, it grew and filled into a mountain that filled the whole earth. That's the re-establishment of God's plan with this creation. And the gospel message invites us to that good news of that coming kingdom. The re-establishment of God's kingdom on this earth for men and women that are willing to serve and obey him according to his truth. We need to be baptised into the saving name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The offer of doing so is eternal life in that kingdom. To have a leadership role in that kingdom. To teach the nations that survive Armageddon of God's ways and his truth. To be one with God. To bring his glory to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And to be part of a, pl of a, of a, of a time where there will be no pain, no sin. No sorrow, no anxiety, no depression, no troubles like we see in this current world. And so my plea to you tonight is not to worry. We've had recorded, I hope, and seen very clearly the purpose of God and what he is shortly to bring to pass. God is in complete control. He cares and protects for those who love him. The question I say to you tonight is, with everything you've heard, with everything we've seen from Ezekiel chapter 38, it's just one small prophecy of scripture. Are we ready? Are we prepared for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? Have we taken all the appropriate actions to make ourselves ready and to be watching and waiting for his coming? 2 Peter 3 tells us, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, 
but that all should come to repentance. And so my prayer for every one of us tonight is to make ourselves ready, to seek repentance through baptism into the saving name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to be part of that people that stand with the Lord Jesus Christ against that nation of Go. Christ and the saints will come across against those nations and destroy them. I pray that all of us in this room tonight will be part of those with the Lord Jesus Christ when he over-destroys the wickedness and the sinful nations of this world. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen.